electrokinetic locomotion, and uh, he'll talk for about 45 minutes. Please interrupt him if you have good questions of, of things that need to be clarified and <coughs> easier during, and then we'll stick around for general questions, and we'll ask everyone in the audience to leave, and then we'll further uh, grill him, and then and then we'll have the outcome. So without further ado, I introduce Jeffrey Moran, uh, and the title of his talk is Electrokinetic Locomotion. Thank you, Dr. Posner. Welcome, everyone, to my exam. Thank you all for being here. So fundamentally, my thesis research has been concerned with understanding electrokinetic locomotion at low Reynolds numbers. So swimming at the micro scale is both abundant and important in nature for a lot of natural processes, including um, muscle contraction, uh, the fusion of a sperm cell with an egg during fertilization, um, the bacteria that swim in our guts, the algae in the ocean. This cartoon here shows a variety of swimming microorganisms, and it's two scale. That scale bar is 10 microns. I'll just point out a few. A is E. coli, <coughs> which is capable of sensing a gradient in nutrient concentration and then swimming towards regions of higher nutrient concentration. E is a human sperm cell. F is a mouse sperm cell. G is Chlamydomonas, which is an alga found in the ocean that does essentially the breaststroke with those two flagella there. And then this large thing in H is a paramecium, which is a small organism that swims to evade predators. So notice that all these swimmers are mechanical. That is, they have some solid appendage that they wave or deform in some way in order to swim. However, not all... Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Why is it nanoscale, given the 10 micron bar right. in the picture? So we can get funding. <laughs> <laughs> this nano so is a nice buzzword happening below the length scales that you're showing that are important? Some of the hydrodynamic effects um, you could consider to be on the nanoscale. It's on less than a micron. Go back. Yeah. Self-propulsion right. at the nanoscale. Oh, right. Yeah, I think it's so it should, probably maybe it should be, <laughs> <laughs> could, okay. could be better to say micro slash nanoscale. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So not, but not all micro scale organisms are necessarily driven mechanically. Um, in 1956, a uh, British scientist named Peter Mitchell, a future Nobel laureate, uh, proposed that some organisms might move in aqueous solutions instead by generating ion currents in their bodies and in the surrounding fluid. So you can kind of see what he means in this uh, figure over here. This is from a later paper by Mitchell. And ions are generated at the body and they're consumed at the tail. And there's this ion flux from forward to back. And Mitchell said, the mechanism I'm suggesting amounts to the use of a stream of ions passing, <coughs> passing within the organism in one direction and over its surface in the other, much as a caterpillar track is used for the locomotion of a tank. And so as interesting as this is, it's a speculative mechanism. He didn't claim to have actually observed it working. He just proposed it. Meanwhile, in nanotechnology, there's a very real demand for micro or nanoscale swimming devices for a number of applications, such as targeted drug delivery in the human body. As almost everyone in this room knows, Richard Feynman gave a lecture in 1959 called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. It's considered the foundation of nanotechnology. Toward the end of the talk, he offered a cash prize to the first person who could make an operating electric motor that can be controlled from the outside and is only 1 64th of an inch on one side. In fact, his challenge was met soon afterward by an engineer named William McClellan. Uh, he made this 2,000 RPM electric motor that consisted of about 13 parts and weighed about uh, 250 micrograms. However, the design wasn't really practically useful, and we're still waiting for a practically and widely applicable swimming device at the nanoscale. <coughs> So back to biology for a bit. Fast forward to 1985 when Waterbury reported that this particular strain of cyanobacteria can swim at up to 25 microns per second without flagella. And the micrograph shows, uh, there's no scale bar, but they're about a micron in size. So 25 microns per second is a non-trivial swimming speed. But again, they don't have any flagella. So that suggests uh, Waterbury actually suggested that they may move by some novel, non-mechanical mechanism, but they didn't provide any details, nor did, were they claiming that the mechanism was operative. <clears throat> a few years later, Anderson proposed that a cell, that a certain type of cell in a concentration gradient of some substance, might be capable of moving ions across its membrane and thus generating an electric field. And that electric field is shown as E0 here, and that 
scales with the concentration gradient. So if the cell has an electrophoretic mobility given by mu e there, then Anderson argued that this would be the propulsive velocity. So note the similarity to the helmholtz molikowski equation, and so it would kind of make sense to call this self-electrophoresis since the part of the cell is generating an electric field that then propels the cell at a speed proportional to the surface charge. And so what Anderson proposed is that maybe this mechanism applies to, the, uh, to these cyanobacteria. However, a few years later, Pitta and Berg um, realized that if one applies an electric field to these Synecococcus cells, they don't drift. They exhibit no electrophoretic mobility at all. And so that's sort of the nail in the coffin because without surface charge, self-electrophoresis doesn't work, as we will see today. So they concluded self-electrophoresis is not the mechanism for Synecococcus. As far as I know, research is still ongoing into the mechanism for this bacterium. Um, there was a paper, at least recently last year, proposing that they have a kind of helical rotor inside their bodies that's hard to see. <clears throat> so the following year, uh, Lammert and others uh, provided one of the first detailed quantitative analyses of self-electrophoresis. Uh, they considered a spherical cell that has a negative surface charge and is uh, 10 microns in radius, and they imposed this sinusoidal variation of electric potential along the surface. So again, the cell is negatively charged, but towards the front of the sphere, it's slightly positive, and towards the end, it's slightly negative. Now that potential variation turns out to generate this electric field, E. And then because the cell is charged, that electric field exerts a force on the cell and propels it forward. So in the box there is their result for the swimming speed. And again, note that it's quite similar to the Smolikowski expression. <clears throat> so just a recap of all this literature review. Uh, Self-electrophoresis has been floating around as a possible uh, propulsion mechanism for more than half a century. It's been analyzed in theoretical detail by Lammert, among others. But to my knowledge, there hasn't been a definitive example of it observed experimentally. That is for natural organisms. But that, doesn't, uh, that does not include synthetic swimmers. So recent technology in, um, in nanofabrication enables us to make synthetic micro swimmers that mimic natural swimmers, um, such as these um, bimetallic micro slash nano rods. They're often referred to as nano rods because their uh, diameter is under a micron. It's a borderline case. But in any case, the rods are typically two microns long, and they consist of two metal segments, uh, typically platinum and gold, but other metals are possible. They're grown by sequentially electroplating the metals into the pores in a uh, membrane. It's about this big, and it's made of aluminum oxide. The membrane is dissolved, and then the rods are suspended. Okay, so this video, which is maybe a little hard to see. <coughs> Good? Right, this is a microscopy, uh, an optical microscopy video that shows the rods in just pure water. So there's nothing really unusual happening here. This is just pure Brownian motion. But if hydrogen peroxide is added to the water, we see this axial motion superimposed on top of the Brownian motion. The speed actually scales with hydrogen peroxide concentration, and although you can't tell from this video, the, s the swimming occurs exclusively with the platinum end directed forward. <clears throat> so ever since they were introduced, the propulsion mechanism for these rods has been the subject of some debate. Uh, many schemes have been proposed, but the one with the most experimental support actually holds that the rods are behaving kind of like Mitchell's bacteria or Lammert's spherical cell. Um, in that they're generating ions in the front of the rod and consuming them at the back, specifically through these electrochemical reactions. So in essence, the rod is acting like an electrochemical cell in short circuit. So on the platinum anode, peroxide is oxidized. It loses electrons, and that releases electrons into the metal and protons and oxygen into the solution. The electrons conduct through the metal from platinum to gold. And then on the gold side, there is a net reduction reaction of peroxide that combines peroxide, protons, and electrons to make water. So overall, the rods consume peroxide, and they make water molecules and oxygen. Now this electron current 
would then be counterbalanced by a proton current, since protons are released here and consumed here, also going from platinum to gold. So again, we have a complete electrical circuit. Now, theoretical analyses of these rods have been primarily quantitative. About the description I just gave is about as far as people have gone. No one has tried yet to really derive a quantitative, rigorous understanding of the motion. And so that brings me to the questions I want to answer today. First, what's the causal chain between the electrochemical reactions and the motion of the rod? How do the reactions lead to the propulsion? How does the speed scale with parameters such as the peroxide concentration, uh, other properties of the solution, the conductivity, the viscosity, or the surface charge or the reaction rate? And finally, what are the important limitations on the rod's capabilities? If we're going to use these for practical applications in nanotechnology, we need to have a firm idea of what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. One of the most important limitations that's been noticed experimentally is that adding, conduct adding uh, salt to the solution and increasing the conductivity leads to a decrease in the swimming speed. So the goal of this research is to answer these questions by doing simulations of the rods. And to do that, we first need to develop a mathematical model. So we consider a cylindrical rod uh, immersed in water containing hydrogen peroxide. The water self-ionizes into protons and hydroxide ions. And we assume a pH of 7. Uh, the distributions of these chemical species are given by the uh, advection diffusion equations with uh, an electromigration term for the ions. <coughs> Wherever the ions are uh, imbalanced, there will be a non-zero charge density at that location. And the charge density is related to the potential, the electric potential, via Poisson's equation. And then wherever in the fluid you see a non-zero charge density and a non-zero electric field, there will be a net body force on the fluid at that point. And that body force is represented here as a forcing term in the Stokes equations, which then give the velocity and pressure distributions. So this is a highly coupled system, seven equations for seven unknowns, and it forms the basis for almost every model of an electrokinetic system. Uh, many people, however, have to make assumptions when they analyze uh, swimming particles like this in order to obtain approximate analytical solutions. Um, for example, assuming that the double layer is infinitely thin or assuming the particle is a spheroid instead of a rod. We want to incorporate all of the important physics and we want to actually account for, this, for the cylindrical geometry of the rod. And so we solve the full nonlinear system of equations. So by choosing some appropriate scalings for the variables, we can derive these non-dimensional forms of the equations. Here we're showing the non-dimensional Stokes equation, and you notice that a Reynolds number pops out. We, if we non-dimensionalize the transport equations for the ions, an electric Rayleigh number pops out, and we also define this parameter beta. And finally, if we non-dimensionalize the reaction boundary condition that specifies the normal flux of protons, we see a dom Kohler number. So I'll discuss each one. The Reynolds number in this case is of order 10 to the minus 5. It's very small, as we would expect. The electric Rayleigh number um, tells the ratio of electroconvection to diffusion. That's also fairly small. The beta parameter tells the relative importance of electromigration and diffusion in transporting ions in the system. And that's about order 0.1. Um, so it's not negligibly small, but it's not huge either. And finally, the dom Kohler number relates the reaction-driven flux to the net diffusive flux in the system. So it's an estimate of the relative importance of those two. And it's defined in general in terms of the reaction-driven flux, J plus, and then these other terms are essentially a characteristic diffusive-driven flux. And it turns out that since the flux is defined differently in different models that we use. Um, this dom Kohler number will take on different forms, and so I'll, I'll show more details on that later. But overall, the takeaway here is that most of the transport occurs by diffusion, and convection is relatively unimportant in transporting mass. Now, you may have noticed in the previous slide a couple of these 
parameters are defined in terms of UEV. UEV is called the electroviscous velocity, and it was first introduced by Hoberg and Melcher in 1976. And it generally is a characteristic fluid speed of any fluid flow that's driven by electric body forces and opposed by viscous forces. So it's defined by essentially a characteristic body force over a characteristic viscous force. D is just a length scale. And so now, if we can derive scaling relations for the charge density and electric field in the system, we can derive um, these scaling laws for the electroviscous velocity. Um, so let's look at these. So there are two different sources of charge density in the system. The first is the reactions, and so that naturally scales with the flux. Second is the surface charge for the cases when the rod is charged. <coughs> the electric field that we care about scales with the reactions. And so if we combine these, on the left here, this is the scaling result for a rod that is not charged. So the key point here is that the electroviscous velocity scales quadratically with the flux in this case. However, if the rod is charged, then we need to consider the charge density in the, in the fluid due to um, the electric double air screening the surface charge. And so we see that the speed should be linear with both zeta potential and flux. Okay, so now I want to show the first set of results for what I'm calling the uncoupled model. What I mean by that is we assume that the proton fluxes are just given by some number that we prescribe. The floating, the, the potential, um, the, the zeta potential of the rod is set to zero. And in general, we can vary the flux and zeta potential independently. And so for this reason, I call them uncoupled. So this is just a visualization here of uniform flux out of platinum and uniform flux into gold. So just a couple of quick words on the simulation domain. <coughs> so this is an axisymmetric problem. So we solve everything in cylindrical coordinates. And we take advantage of this uh, computationally by solving a two-dimensional slice of the three-dimensional problem. All the simulations are done in the reference frame of the particle, so the rod is actually stationary while the fluid flows around it. And here you see the mesh. There's about 128,000 mesh elements, and the vast majority of them are concentrated near the particle. The mesh resolution is such that in the electric double layer, each mesh element measures roughly one nanometer on one side. Just a quick word on the numerics. We solve this, solve the equations using the finite element method. Um, as I mentioned, 128,000 mesh elements, and we use a solver called Pardiso to solve the resulting linear system that <coughs> that the finite element method produces from the system of PDEs. So now some results. Again, this is assuming no surface charge. We're just injecting protons from the platinum side uniformly, and we're consuming them uniformly on the gold surface. <clears throat> so in color, we're showing a dimensionless proton concentration, and the black contour lines are electric potential. And dotted lines indicate negative values. <clears throat> so first you'll notice that proton concentration is uniformly perturbed, or it's symmetrically perturbed, rather. So it's very positive on, um, positive related to the background uh, value on platinum, and negative related to the background on gold. And the electric potential resembles a dipole. And both of these are expected from the boundary conditions. Now this color plot looks qualitatively the same, but this is actually charge density. And again, as we'd expect, since protons are in excess here, the fluid is positively charged. And here the fluid is negatively charged. Now Gauss's law says that charge density acts as either a source or a sink of electric field, depending on its sign. And so it makes sense that we would see this dipolar electric field, similar to what Lambert uh, saw, with a source at platinum and a sink at gold. Now, the electric field is going to exert a Lorentz force on the charged fluid. That's given by this uh, expression here. So we can see that where the charge density is positive, the force and the electric field will be in the same direction. When it's negative, they'll be in opposite directions. So now look closely at the, and this region right in here. And we specifically care about the z direction, that is the vertical direction, because that's the direction the rod's going to move in. 
And you'll notice that the Z component of electric field here is pretty much uniformly downward. That is pointing from platinum to gold. So near platinum, where charge density is positive, the electric body force will also point in this direction. Near gold, charge density is negative, so the resulting body force will be in this direction. So given that, it makes sense that we should see this for the velocity field. Again, this is, for un this is only for an uncharged rod. So these fluid streams are essentially coming together at the junction between platinum and gold, and they're forced outward because the fluid is incompressible to conserve mass. So this is a quadrupolar velocity field, similar to um, induced charge electrosmosis. And the important thing here, though, is that if you look far enough away from the rod, the fluid is quiescent. And what that means is the rod is not moving. It's just generating these, uh, <coughs> these flow patterns, um, and, but remaining stationary. So we can compare this with the scaling analysis. So now we're showing the Eulerian fluid speed at a particular point in the system as a function of flux. It turns out the same trend shows up no matter what point you look at. So the squares are simulation data, and the line is a quadratic least squares fit. As you can see, the agreement is excellent. And uh, as I mentioned, the trend is the same uh, for other points. However, the fluid velocities are very small. So consider that the characteristic Brownian velocity of a simple particle just undergoing Brownian motion is about 3 microns per second. So even if we could produce this case definitively in reality, it's unlikely we could see any of these, any of these flow patterns because of Brownian motion. So this case isn't likely to ever be observed experimentally, but it shows that charge density and electric field by themselves can generate a, uh, an electroviscous flow. And we can also predict and understand the behavior with the scaling analysis. Can I ask a yeah. question? So what if the ratio of light scales were, instead of 50-50, right. one-third, two-thirds for each of the different right. metals? Uh, we've looked at that. The symmetry is broken. And so that would lead to some locomotion. But again, it would be relatively, if it, given that the, the rod is uncharged, um, the, the, the motion would not be appreciable. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what does it take to make the rod move at an appreciable speed? So let's take the uncoupled model, still with the constant fluxes, and, but now let's prescribe a negative surface charge. And again, we can make them whatever we want. We can vary them independently, so this is still the uncoupled model. <clears throat> so let's look for a second at just what you would see if you had a negatively charged particle but with no reactions. So in this case, uh, color is charge density, and the electric field lines point into the negatively charged particle. And as we would expect, for a uniform negative surface charge, we see uniform positive charge in the EDL surrounding the rod. So keep this electric field in mind, and remember that the reactions by themselves, with no surface charge, generate this dipolar electric field. So now, when, now that we're including both reactions and zeta potential, we have to superimpose these electric fields and charge density fields. And we get this. So the electric field, the, the shape of the electric field streamlines can sort of be understood by remembering that we're combining two electric fields here. Now, the important point here, though, <coughs> is that the Z component near the rod of the electric field is still downward. It still points from platinum to gold. And additionally, the charge density here, as you can see, is pretty much uniformly positive. So essentially, the negative charge density we saw here is kind of being canceled out by the EDL that uniformly surrounds the particle. So recall that when charge density is positive, the body force and electric field point in the same direction. So that means the body force is downward everywhere. And so it makes sense that we should see the velocity, the fluid velocity moving downward everywhere. Now remember I said this, these simulations are in the reference frame of the particle. And so the particle's stationary and fluid flows from platinum to gold. That's equivalent by a Galilean invariance to the particle swimming through quiescent fluid with the platinum end forward. And that's the direction we see in experiments. <clears throat>
So to measure the swimming speed, what we do is we look on the opposite end of the simulation domain, about 50 rod lengths away from the particle, and we look at what the fluid speed is downward, and then we take that as the swimming speed of the rod. <clears throat> Thus, surface charge essentially breaks the symmetry of that quadrupolar flow I showed earlier, and it's actually, it leads to movement of the rod. So we can look at the effects of varying zeta potential and reaction rate independently. <clears throat> so the open symbols here are simulations for four different values of zeta, and the black symbols are experiments. <clears throat> so we immediately see that the relationship, the linear relationship between flux and speed is confirmed. <clears throat> and additionally, the speed scales with zeta potential, and that relationship also turns out to be uh, linear. And we also see pretty good ex agreement with the experiments if you assume a zeta potential of about negative 25 millivolts. Same coefficient in all the curves? Uh, which coefficient? So you have a proportionality. Right. So, yes, essentially, uh, what's in the fraction here, you mean? Well, so it's proportional, so there must be a coefficient in front of it, equal to constant times zeta. Yeah. Well, it's a scaling analysis. Right. So that's what I'm wondering, does it scale each other? The same way. I believe it should. Um, we'll look at a, a couple of plots I'm in sure a. I understand the question. He's asking because this, I, if I understand you correctly, uh, because this is not an equal sign, that technically maybe there's another, there, there are more constants of proportionality here that maybe I'm not considering. Yeah, I, I think the point here is that if any of these variables, lambda d or d and eta, they go up or down, then we expect the slope of the curve to change. But it's not going to be exact number. It's not like you get the diffusivity of an ion, you plug it in, and take the viscosity, and you plug it in. It's not an exact formula. It's a, it's proportional. So there is so potentially some number that gets multiplied. Is it just the age curve? Uh, I, that proportionality constant. I believe I believe it's the same. Um, we're gonna in a couple minutes. We're gonna d compare this model to another one to to the the more updated model, and I believe they're the same. And I'll sh I'll, sh I'll show you why. So everything so far has been uncoupled. We've just been choosing a flux and choosing a zeta potential. However, the rod, remember, is in essence a short-circuited electrochemical cell. And electrochemistry theory says that not only are the potential of a cell and the reaction rates related to each other, there's a sense in which they, can, they determine each other. So to be a truly realistic model of the nanorods, or microrods, we have to account for that coupling. So <clears throat> let's examine the region near the surface a little more closely. So we use the GUI Chapman Stern model of the interface that consists of a charged surface. This is the Stern layer of adsorbed immobile species. This is called the outer Helmholtz plane, this outer boundary. And then we have this diffuse layer of solvated ions where uh, ions that oppose the, surf the surface charge are enriched, and ions that are the same charge as the surface are depleted. And then down here, we show the potential profile close to the surface. Um, and I should note that I'm specifically defining the zeta potential at the outer Helmholtz plane because we're considering that to be the slit plane, and that's traditionally where zeta is defined. And we're calling it the slit plane because everything inside the OHP is immobile. And everything outside the OHP is free to move. So therefore, the OHP is actually where we apply the no-slip condition for the fluid flow. And so that's why I'm, I've defined that as the location of the zeta potential. So <clears throat> to account for both of these layers, we use this mixed boundary condition on the potential. So again, zeta is the potential at the OHP. Phi rod is the potential of the metal internally, which by the way, is the same on platinum and gold, since the rod is a conductor. <clears throat> and what this <clears throat> boundary condition tells you is that you're essentially taking the potential gradient at the OHP, and you're linearly extrapolating it across the stern layer to <clears throat> obtain the rod potential. And so it's useful to define this stern voltage here as the difference between the rod potential and zeta potential. Now for the reaction boundary conditions. So from electrochemistry theory, the Butler-Volmer equation with Frumkin's correction uh, should be used to describe the kinetics. And you see that for platinum and for gold here. 
So the math is a little convoluted, but the important thing to notice is that the fluxes, instead of being constant, are now a function of the, these are rate constants, these Ks. Uh, they're a function of the reactant concentrations. And they're a function of the stern voltage, which is normalized by the thermal voltage. N is the number of electrons transferred, and alpha is a symmetry parameter. That's pretty much always set to 1 half. <coughs> Yeah. One question about your previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so phi rod is is, is constant uh, everywhere on the surface, but um, it seemed like in your previous work you were suggesting that zeta the zeta potential was also constant. Right. Uh, and it's not entirely clear to me from this model okay. why that should be the case. Sure. Phi rod is actually not defined on the surface. Uh, phi rod is right on the metal. Right. It's it's kind of the interior the potential of the interior of the metal. And um, so essentially the difference here is that we're, that what we're accounting for here is this term that we were not including before. So before we were essentially including, assuming that these were the same. Okay, but why, I, I'm trying to figure out how this is used. It seems like the PDX is, is partly a function of what's going on the electric field outside exactly. the fluid. It is, it is a function of what's in the fluid. And phi rod is the same everywhere in the metal. Mm -hmm. So why should zeta be the same? Or is zeta, in fact, the same everywhere over the surface? It no. With in general, it varies with position on and the surface. Like in your last picture, you were assuming constant zeta potential. Right. right. So what, what, what we're going to find is that if you don't, in, if <coughs> If the solution doesn't have any salt in it, then this diffuse layer is very thick. And the importance of this term scales is the ratio of lambda s divided by the thickness. And so when lambda s over lambda d is very small, when lambda, eight, lambda d is thick, then that term there that depends on the gradient is negligibly small. Um, so one, another way of thinking about this is in the previous simulations, Zeta was a variable which he just chose and mm -hmm. set everywhere. And it was exactly equal to phi rod mm -hmm. because delta phi s, which is the bottom equation, was zero everywhere. And <coughs> now he says, well, I want to know what delta phi s is because it's important for my electrochemistry. And I want to know what zeta is because it's important for the transport of electrokinetics. And uh, in fact, he doesn't know any of them. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know phi rod, he doesn't know beta, he doesn't know delta So he's got three unknowable. Right. Okay. So again, with the reaction boundary conditions, just to sum up again, <coughs> fluxes are a function of rate constants, which, by the way, are fitting parameters. We choose values for them that yield reasonable values of the swimming velocity. <coughs> the stern voltages. Um, as we'll see, um, can affect the kinetics. <coughs> and we can make some simplifications to this equation. The first one is that we can assume that they're in the Tafel regime. And so this is essentially saying that the reactions proceed in one direction only. So when peroxide, for example, is oxidized on platinum into O2 and protons and electrons, we're assuming that that O2 and protons and electrons don't recombine back into peroxide. Um, <clears throat> now, the, as I mentioned, the rate constants are fitting parameters. Um, and it turns out that we can show, this is what I was talking about a minute ago, that the ratio of delta phi s to phi rod scales as the ratio of the lengths of the stern layer and the diffuse layer. And for the initial simulations I'm going to show, lambda d is 1 micron, whereas lambda s is usually between 2 and 10 angstroms. So in this case, this assumption is well, it's, it's uh, justifiable to assume that delta phi s star is very small, and these exponential terms are close to 1. And so for that reason, can, yeah. So why is that topple regime then? Aren't those completely That's, disconnected? Topple is usually high over. So the overpotential is still significant. So this is, this is different from the overpotential. This is just the voltage across the stern layer. Um, so you, you're saying that you have large deviations from the overall potential from the rod, 
but not in the stern wire. The, the potential of the rod deviates significantly from the equilibrium potential that would cause zero current. Um, so, so the mist, so you it's have a mixed a potential. Mixed potential that right. deviates substantially from, because you have only one chemistry. So there's one equilibrium potential. Well, there's. Your chemistry, is, your chemistry is peroxide going one way or peroxide going the other way. Two different but they're two different reactions, though. But the equilibrium does not care about the metal. The equilibrium of peroxide to water and oxygen is independent of the metal. The mm -hmm. rate constants depend on the metal, but the equilibrium potential is uh, mm -hmm. independent of the metal because you don't see metal showing up in that equation. So. The only mm -hmm. thing on the right-hand side of the free energy is the concentration of the reactants in solution. Metal doesn't show up. The kinetics it does, and in the mixed potential, the mixed potential depends on the metals because kinetics, because that's a kinetic phenomenon, not an equilibrium one. But so I'm, I'm not sure I get how you can expand the, the, um, you know, be at topple and take this limit to. Zero. Hmm. I think it would be helpful uh, to answer this question by looking at the derivation of this equation from the standard butler volmer where you have overpotential. Right. The PS is not overpotential. No, so I right. think when you're used to seeing overpotential and you're used to that that being large for the top over regime, or then and then we say it's small, then those things seem <coughs> counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But the equilibrium potential is wrapped up in K here. So I don't know if we want to do this now or we no, want to do it later. It's totally up to you. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, we can I'm talk. fine. I just, I, you know, it just, as you're taking a potential to zero mm -hmm. and doing the Taylor series limit at, at that limit and you're right. using topple, which is, uh, right. you know, so you've got topple, large deviation from equilibrium mm -hmm. in both directions because you've got both the anodic and the cathodic topple shown there. Right. Right. And and given there's one rod potential, and equilibrium is the same for both metals, mm. I I'm don't not, get it. Well, I'm not sure I agree that the equilibrium is the same for both metals because they're different redox couples. The reactions are the, the the reactions have the same participants, but the redox couples are different. So the E zeros for those reactions on platinum and gold should be different. Why? Because. There's uh, on platinum. Yeah, so so this E zero is I think uh, minus point six volts versus N H E, and then this is platinum, and then gold. Um, and then the E0 here, I want to say, is about minus 1.7 volts. So if you do the Nernst equation to find the equilibrium for both, then you should use these E0s. You, you, should, you should use this E0 for the... So it is not the exact same. I was thinking that they were the exact same redox couple right. in, in both directions. That has been assumed by uh, a recent paper that, um, that did an analytical treatment of this stuff. But um, here we're solving the full, the same react, the different reactions. Yeah. So does it depend on oxygen, whether you deoxygenate or not? It does. It does. Okay. So um, right. we actually showed with our collaborators that if you purge the solution of oxygen, they speed up. And if you have oxygen in the solution, it slows them down. Okay. Yeah. Now I get why this would okay. be in topple and right. satisfy that. I thought they were okay. the exact same chemistry going backwards and forwards. So essentially, what we're saying is the rod, the interior of the rod, attains some potential that's kind of in between these two. I totally get it. Cool. Yeah. All right. So uh, now, because the fluxes are given by these Butler-Volmer expressions, uh, the dom Kohler numbers take on these slightly more complicated forms. Uh, so again, we're showing the dimensionless uh, reaction boundary conditions. And <clears throat> now we find that the Domkohler numbers, which again relate uh, the reactions to diffusion 
uh, are roughly order 10. And so what that says is that not all of the protons that are generated on platinum are transported by diffusion. <clears throat> However, diffusion is still the dominant mode of transport. So one more note, at steady state, the total charge in the rod has to be a constant. If it wasn't, then as time goes to infinity, the charge in the rod would approach plus or minus infinity. So we need to force the net current out of platinum to equal the net current into gold. And this is done, as it is in reality, by finding a mixed potential, by finding the region, the potential in between these two that leads to, that satisfies this uh, requirement. And it turns out that the fluxes depend on the potential of the rod. And so, in a way, the kinetics determine the final value of rod potential. And again, this wasn't a problem with the uncoupled model because we just forced the fluxes to be equal and opposite on platinum and gold, and we just specified a value of zeta. So for this reason, we say the potential and the flux are coupled. So now let's compare the coupled model with the uncoupled model and experiments. So in red, we're showing the same uncoupled data that I showed before, assuming a zeta potential of minus 20. In blue is the coupled model, and in black is the same experimental data that we showed before. So the quadratic shape, which is immediately apparent here, for the blue data can be explained by, again, looking at the scaling analysis. From the kinetic expressions, the flux varies linearly with peroxide. So as we increase peroxide, flux varies linearly. As we'll show in a second, uh, the zeta potential also varies uh, linearly with peroxide concentration. And so when we multiply those two effects together, we see this quadratic shape. Now, you can immediately notice, too, that we've made the model more complicated, but the agreement with experiments is not really as good. So there are a couple possible reasons for this. The first is that the rate constants, which we've assumed to be constant here, we've assumed that they don't vary at all with peroxide. In reality, it's possible that they do. Um, particularly inversely with peroxide concentration. So if we account for that, then, this, um, then the rate constant should fall off a little bit up here, and it might be a little bit larger here, and so that would flatten this curve out a bit. More importantly, we also don't account for the potential saturation of reaction sites, of available uh, sites on the platinum and gold for the reaction to occur at high concentration. And in reality, of course, there's only a finite number of those sites. So eventually, the reaction rate and thus the speed should level off. And that's seen experimentally, too. <clears throat> so this just shows that, indeed, zeta potential is a linear function of peroxide concentration. <clears throat> and so now, let's, com let's normalize. Let's just divide everything through by zeta potential and look at only the dependence on flux. So since the flux in the coupled model is non-uniform, we, we had to compute the area averaged flux. And so that's shown on the x-axis. Of course, for the uncoupled data, it's, they're the same. And both of, they both show a definite linear relationship. In fact, they pretty much collapse onto the same line. So this, is, um, this kind of brings up Dr. Riley's point that <coughs> just looking at the rest of the the reason, I, the reason the slopes are the same, I think, is because all of the constants of proportionality here are the same between the uncoupled and the coupled cases. And so that would give me confidence that in all the cases in the uncoupled model that um, we should see this same behavior, too. So I would think that the, whatever constants we're not including there should be the same. <clears throat> so the important thing about this plot, though, is not that they collapse onto the same line, but it's just that they're both linear. and they both show a linear relationship between speed over zeta and flux. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that times 10 to the minus 6 meaning that those are order 10 to the 6th or order 10 to the minus 6? It means order 10 to the minus 6. Um, right. So it's, it just means each one of these numbers is actually multiplied times 10 to the minus 6. Yeah. Cool. And we also verified, we've also verified through simulations that the speed is inversely proportional to viscosity and linearly proportional with the rod length, which is h. So now I want to shift gears a little and talk about the limitations on the rods, especially the effect of changing the conductivity of the solution. So the Penn State groups that originally introduced these rods showed this plot in 2006. 
And it's essentially speed versus inverse conductivity. So it shows that as you increase conductivity, the velocity decreases. And if you add enough salt, you can actually stop the motion completely. So what does the model have to say about this? So we wanted to account now for all possible contributions to the solution conductivity. So of course, when water is brought into equilibrium with atmospheric air, the CO2 in the air dissolves into the solution and it makes carbonic acid. <clears throat> this lowers the pH from the value of 7 we were assuming before. And it also introduces new ionic species into the solution. Um, carbonic acid is diprotic. So it can actually dissociate twice, first into bicarbonate and then into carbonate. We did some equilibrium calculations with uh, MiniQL software. And that, along with some analytical uh, work, showed that essentially carbonate and hydroxide for a realistic pH are negligible compared to the concentration of bicarbonate. And so in the simulations, we just assume that protons and bicarbonate ions are concentrated at 0.9 micromolar. So that's equivalent to a pH a little above 6. And what we're going to do is then add potassium chloride, sodium nitrate, and lithium nitrate to vary the solution conductivity. <clears throat> so I mentioned before that the stern voltage can be significant if uh, lambda d is small, or that it's insignificant when lambda d is large. So now that we're adding salt, we're decreasing lambda d. And so for that reason, um, to be on the safe side, we are, we're not assuming that these are zero anymore. We're including the exponential terms. But we're still in the TAFL regime. So here's what happens to the model when we add salt. So the color scale is the same for both plots. Red means high speed and blue means low speed. And in the left, we're only including peroxide and carbonic acid. And in the right, we have carbonic acid with KCl added to increase the conductivity to about 8.8. .8. And so you can immediately see that there's a significant speed reduction brought on by increasing conductivity by a little, o little more than an order of magnitude. <clears throat> so now let's compare the model to experiments and previous analytical work. So we see reasonable agreement between the simulations in red and the experiments in black and analytical work in blue. Um, and you can reproduce the trend um, with the scaling analysis without carrying out any detailed simulations. And there's surprisingly good agreement with the analytical formula shown here as V-Golest at high values of conductivity. But the agreement gets worse and worse as the conductivity decreases. And we attribute this to the fact that Golestanian is assuming that the double layer is infinitely thin around the, around the swimmer. And while that's probably tr that's close to true at 100 microsiemens per centimeter, as you decrease salt, the double layer gets thicker and thicker. And so that's, that assumption is less and less justified. I also want to mention that the values for current density and zeta potential were fed into this formula from the simulation. So Golestadian didn't actually predict these values at these conductivities. It's just, um, this is just a validation of the simulation algorithm, essentially. So now let's look at the results of using different electrolytes. So each color here corresponds to a different salt. And you'll notice that if you achieve the same conductivity with two different salts, the speeds in general are not the same. And that can be understood because you need a different ion concentration for different salts to achieve the same conductivity, because conductivity depends on the mobility of the ions. And so we thought, what if we look at the effects of just concentration and remove mobility from the picture? And that's shown on the right here. So we immediately see that there's, there seems to be a direct correlation between uh, ionic strength and swimming speed. But overall, the take home message is, of course, we recreate the decrease in speed by adding salt. So why is this? Well, the motion is driven by the electric field. So how does the electric field react to the change in conductivity? Well, from Ohm's law, in general, when conductivity is increased, if current density stays about the same, electric field should decrease. Excuse me. And that's indeed what we see here. E50 
is the electric field measured 50 nanometers away from the rod, uh, from the rod's surface at the junction between platinum and gold. And the electric field there is indeed strong. Uh, it's you know, thousands of volts per meter. And it falls off, as we would expect, with conductivity. However, the electric field is very non-uniform throughout the domain. And there's no guarantee that you would see this exact same trend if you looked at every other point in the domain. <clears throat> so looking at the electric field at one place may not tell you the whole story. So instead, we, def we define this characteristic electric field E star that's equal to, it's essentially the electric field you would have to apply in order to drive conventional ele electrophoresis of the rod at the observed swimming speed. And so we want to get an idea of what the electric field is doing as a whole, and we think E star is a good estimate of that. And <clears throat> if you look at the value here, at the minimum conductivity and the, and the maximum, we find that E star decreases by a factor of about an order of magnitude. So next, the zeta potential also changes with salt concentration. Note that the same collapse happens when we plot zeta potential versus um, ionic strength instead of conductivity. I should, I should emphasize that now zeta potential is non-uniform along the rod, so we're actually plotting the area averaged zeta potential, which turns out to be pretty close to phi rod. But there seems to be a direct correlation, again, between ionic strength and zeta potential. And of course, there's also a direct connection between zeta potential and swimming speed, as we identified in the scaling analysis and, um, as previous people have noted, um, with their analytical expressions. So zeta decreases by a factor of about 1.8 from the minimum to the maximum. Finally, we also note that the total flux out of platinum or total flux into gold decreases by a factor of about 1.2. So it's a, it's a more weak decay, but it's still it's still present. So why is this? Let's look back at the kinetic expressions. Well, it can't be the rate constants because those are the same. Peroxide concentration is kept constant through all of these salt simulations. And it's only perturbed very minutely by the reactions. And so that probably isn't it. So that leaves the proton concentration and the stern voltages. So let's look at and let's try to find out how important stern voltage actually is. <clears throat> so this is the stern voltage as a function of position along the rod as a function of conductivity. So we see that, as we would expect, the magnitude of stern voltage increases as conductivity increases. Again, that's because the diffuse layer is becoming compressed. And so the potential gradient at the OHP is becoming steeper. And that leads to a larger stern voltage. <clears throat> We can quantify the dependence. <coughs> so once again, <coughs> we predicted this linear relationship between um, stern voltage over phi rod and lambda s over lambda d. And we indeed see a pretty good um, linear agreement. But keep in mind, the, this ratio delta phi s over phi rod here is still very small. And <coughs> it turns out that the exponential terms on both sides are never larger than 1.03, and they're never smaller than 0.97. So <clears throat> we conclude that the stern voltage is probably not the only reason that the reaction rate decays with salt. What I think is happening is the addition of salt changes the composition of the electric double layer. Now there are more, that salt is about two orders of magnitude more concentrated than protons in the EDL. So the more salt you add, the fewer protons you need to screen the surface charge. And thus, there are fewer protons that are available to participate in this reaction on the gold, because you need, you can see you need two protons here. So in effect, adding salt limits the rate of this reaction. And since we have to conserve current, if this reaction rate is limited, then this one should be limited too. So I believe that's what's happening. That's what's causing the this decay here. So again, the flux decreases by a factor of 1.2 from the minimum to the maximum conductivity. And <clears throat> so looking back at this slide, um, the speed decays from by about a factor of a little over 20 from the maximum to the minimum. So if you take the reduction in electric field, that's about a factor of 10. Reduction in zeta potential, it's a factor of 1.8. <clears throat> 
the reduction in reaction rate of a factor of 1.2. You multiply those together, you get something a little over 20. So the overall reduction factor is just about right for these three to be the predominant reasons why the addition of salt slows the rods down. Now we didn't account, sorry. Yeah. Can, can't you just, you're computing the surface concentration of the protons. Yes. So, I mean, do you have to guess? No, it, uh, we, we did look, and it is, it is slightly lower. Yeah, it's, um, it's on the order of, I'd estimate about 70% about of, so at the, at the maximum value here, the minimum concentration in the system is about 70% of what it is here. The thing is, though, that's, I mean, that's a small, that's a relatively small decrease, but we're assuming it's second order in peroxide, or protons. So because it's, the reaction rate depends quadratically, then that decrease should get magnified. So just a quick summary, going back to the main questions I posed. Um, how do the reactions lead to motion? So the reactions lead to an asymmetric concentration distribution of protons, and that creates a dipolar charge density distribution that then generates an electric field. And if the rod is charged, then it generates an electroviscous flow that propels the rod, and it's driven by body forces. How does the speed depend on parameters? So it's linear with flux and surface potential for a charged rod. And it's inverse with viscosity and either conductivity or ionic strength, depending on how you think about it. And finally, the three primary reasons the rod speed decreases with conductivity are the decrease in electric field, because the solution is more conductive, the decrease in average zeta potential, and the decrease in the reaction rate. So in my opinion, these seem to be inherent limitations to this mechanism. And so it's unlikely, unless we can find some one particular salt like silver that's been shown to speed the rods up, in general, it's unlikely that we would be able to get these rods to move at high conductivity in general. So <coughs> the <coughs> contributions of this research are listed here. Uh, the papers in black are related to the rods. In particular, papers two and four, which are specifically the theoretical model. Papers in blue are published but not related to this work, and papers in red are still in preparation. Financial support for this research came largely from the NSF through the Graduate Research Fellowship as well as a CBET grant awarded to our group. All the individuals pictured here had some role to play in the completion of this work, so rather than acknowledge all of them in Individually, I will just say thank you to all of them. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my committee members who not only made this work better with helpful discussions and challenging coursework, but also by giving me valuable career advice, but also gave me valuable career advice. I'd especially like to thank my advisor, Jonathan Posner, whose mentorship and guidance greatly evolved my skills as a researcher over the past six years, as well as a, com as a communicator. So with that, um, Oh yeah, and thank you to my friends and family back home, of course, and my girlfriend. But thank you all for coming. I'm done. So we have a couple minutes for quick questions from the, from the gallery here. I guess I answered all of them. <laughs> Um, okay, so that concludes sort of the public uh, section of the exam, so um, we'll excuse the rest of you and, and uh, you have to stay here with the rest of the committee. Should we, we record this part? No, <laughs> we should not. Should not. Oh.